bites. Treasurer, welcome to Insiders. Good morning, Fran. The Prime Minister has said the Westpac board has to be accountable for this breach. What does accountability look like? Well, there must be accountability and uh, that will obviously involve decisions that they take about the futures of senior management as well as the board. But these are very serious issues, Fran, uh, both in terms of the nature and the number of alleged breaches. We're talking about 23 million breaches, alleged breaches of the anti-money laundering laws. We're talking about a failure to adequately assess customers uh, with links to child trafficking and child pornography uh, and we've seen from Austrac a statement that there has been indifference by the board, that there's been a systemic failure by the bank and there's been inadequate oversight. Given those findings, you say that the, you know, the board will have to take some action. If the CEO of Westpac and even the chair of Westpac are still in place in six months time, would you be happy with that? Well, Fran, the first thing I'd say is history shows you, and don't forget we had the Commonwealth Bank experience uh, with, again, breaches of anti-money laundering laws. History shows you that these uh, issues build a momentum of their own and where boards start is not necessarily where boards finish. Uh, now, APRA uh, has the ability under the Banking Executive Accountability Regime to disqualify boards and to disqualify executives where there's a failure uh, to appropriately enforce and uh, uphold the, the duties under the legislation. Legislation. Now, that legislation came in 2018, came into force in 2018. Some of these, it's not retrospective, and some of those, uh, some of those alleged breaches date back to 2013. But the anti-money laundering laws are a prescribed activity under APRA, and I know that APRA is looking at it. So you would expect APRA this to trigger those BAR responsibilities, so some kind of disqualification of executives? Would well, you expect that? Well, APRA is an independent agency like Austrac and they will uh, determine their own conclusions. But what I will say is that they are looking at it uh, and obviously they have particular powers under that legislation that we introduced. You're the Treasurer. You introduced those powers. You're also responsible for the banks. The Prime Minister has said this, this incident has damaged people's confidence in our banking system. As the Treasurer, what action do you want to see? Well, you, the Prime Minister is not wrong there. Um, there is a lack of trust and confidence among the public after the Royal Commission with some of our leading financial institutions. The, and now this. And, and now this, which again... And all we've got to review so far. Which, what do you want to see? Does there need well, to be more? Well, as I said, I think these issues develop a momentum of their own. They've got a uh, AGM on the 12th of December and no doubt there'll be some very hard discussions between now and then. Have you spoken to the CEO and the chair yet of West Bank? I have. And what did you tell them? Well, obviously I've made very clear the, the seriousness of these issues, but they also made very clear to me that they have a process uh, now underway where they're bringing in independent experts in uh, and they're determined to, to provide a way forward. And of course, this is before the courts too. I'm going to, I know it's difficult for you, but I am going to ask you one more time. What do you think? Should these people keep their jobs? Well, again, our, our position has consistently been uh, decisions about who are on boards are matters uh, for shareholders and who are on executive teams are matters for boards. That being said, these are very serious issues. There must be accountability. Austrac have been highly critical in their statement and now APRA is looking into it. So I don't think there's any doubt as, as to the seriousness of these issues in the government's position. Do the stakes need to be raised even higher? Westpac will have to pay. The fines will be considerable in the billions or almost definitely, which handily for you will go to your bottom line. Um, but it is a big bank. It will be able to afford that. Should jail sentences, should criminal charges be introduced for individuals, as Alan Fells was suggesting. Well, let's wait and see how the Austrac uh, um, court case plays out. Uh, but let's also be very clear that we have put in place uh, criminal penalties, na na namely fines, through the APRA process as well. Um, we've beefed up the resources. So APRA can agency. do more than just disqualify executives? That's right. They can uh, apply to the court for fines up to $500 million. For individuals? Uh, that's for an organisation, of and course. What about well, I don't think many individuals could afford No, that. no. What about individuals, though? Is there the capacity? Is there the capacity to disqualify and then there are fines that they can apply to the court uh, to apply to an organisation where there has been a failure? The sheer dimension of the breaches is one thing. As you said, 23 million breaches worth $11 billion. Um, but it really is much worse than that. Westpac were aware of the risks that some of these overseas payments uh, could be abused of pedophiles in the Philippines. They were made aware of that. It seems they didn't care enough to fix a breach when it occurred, that this was happening. What does that say 
about attitudes within the banking sector towards anything but profits. Is that the problem here? Well, I don't think anyone condones, uh, and certainly people within these financial institutions that I've met, and I know, no one condones uh, the, uh, the trafficking of children and child pornography. I mean, they are the most. I'm not suggesting they condone. They are the most abhorrent of crimes. But what we do know is money laundering uh, precipitates, uh, you know, dangerous crimes, and that's the that's what's at issue here. And clearly, Austrac has said uh, that there's been a system failure at Australia's oldest bank. Are you worried that this kind of failure for these kind of sex trafficking crimes and pedophilic crimes um, could be slipping through other banks? I'm Are you going to take any steps to try and make sure the banks have another look at this? Well, deeply concerned about the nature of um, these alleged breaches and very focused on ensuring that Austrac have all the resources necessary to ensure that every bank, every financial institution in our country upholds the law. Do you think Australians will be happy if at the end of this, as I say, in six months' time or 12 months' time, no one's lost their job over this? Well, again, I, I don't think you should reach that conclusion at this point in time. They've got an AGM on December the 12th. There'll be some tough conversations between now and then. Um, the board, um, uh, management, they're all seized of this issue uh, and they're now going through a process. But with APRA, uh, providing additional focus as well as Austrac, uh, certainly the heat is on the company. Treasurer, let's go to the economy more broadly. Is the announcement this week of $3.8 billion of infrastructure being brought forward and admission that the economy has stalled and it needs some stimulus from the government? Well, the economy continues to grow and, in fact, the OECD... Well, then why out... are we bothering putting out $3.8 billion? Because we, because we believe that investment in infrastructure is a pathway to higher growth and to more jobs and to boosting the productive capacity of our country. Now, the Prime Minister wrote shortly after the election to state uh, premiers and, and, and leaders uh, to offer an opportunity to work together to bring forward projects. Now, the end result is $3.8 billion of projects that have been brought forward, $1.8 billion, uh, to be spent over the next 18 months on major projects, Fran, like in, in South Australia, it's the North-South Corridor, it's the North East Link in Victoria, it's the Tonkin Highway in Western Australia, it's the Princess sure, Highway in New South Wales. but you've only brought them forward Wales. because, as you say, the economy continues to grow, but it's pretty sluggish growth. What was it? One point... The slowest growth in a, in a GDP in a decade at 1.4 per cent. Pretty slow. Unemployment went up this month. Employment had the biggest monthly fall in, th in three years. Retail sales fell. We haven't had uh, retail sales this bad since 1990. Well, Things aren't good. Well, you give me those figures and I'll let me give you a few others. Okay. Uh, when we came to government, unemployment was 5.7 per cent. Today it's 5.3 per cent. We have a record number of Australians in jobs. We've just produced the first uh, current account surplus since 1975. We've got the lowest welfare dependency in 30 years. We've provided the biggest tax cuts legislated through the parliament in more than 20 years and the budget is back in balance, already delivered for the first time in, in 11 years. Sure. And, and right. we're going to deliver a surplus and that means paying down uh, Labor's debt and we, right now we have an interest bill of around $19 billion a year. That's more than double what we spend every year on childcare and, an, and nearly the same amount that we spend on schools. So what we need to do is build the resilience of the Australian economy to face those domestic and global economic headwinds that all countries are facing, particularly the trade tensions, but here at home a punishing drought as well. Do you accept though that Households don't have faith in the economy because if they did, they would have splashed their tax cuts, not banked them, not paid down debt. Well, there's no doubt um, that households are paying down some of their mortgage and most families are now ahead of um, their mortgage payments. But it's not for me to tell the Australian people how to spend their money. No, it's no, I'm them. asking you, do you accept that that's a reflection that people don't have much faith in the economy? Well, I accept that when people look globally, particularly with the, the trade tensions and also some of the challenges here, um, that they would uh, pay down um, some, of their, uh, some of their mortgage. But at the same time, they are spending. Um, they're spending throughout the economy and we have seen, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the housing market state to start to stabilise. Prices have started to go up. Mining investment is coming back. And, of course, we have a record number of Australians in a job. Yeah, but they're spending, but they're not spending as they were. Retail sales are at their lowest point since 1990. Have the Reserve Bank cuts in interest rates backfired? Have they damaged consumer confidence? Look, I don't think they have. Um, but as 
as you know, the Reserve Bank has a triple mandate, uh, not only price stability and the prosperity and the welfare of Australians, but also full employment. And the Reserve Bank has been very conscious of what has happened globally with more than 50 central banks reducing their interest rates. And they don't want to see the Australian dollar mm. appreciate because if it does, then that will affect jobs. But when you point out the retail sector, it's a bit unclear as to how much is cyclical and how much is structural because there's a lot of disruption taking place in that sector. OK, but in terms of the rate cuts, Economists are starting to factor in a further rate cut. Would that help? Is that a good idea? Well, again, um, matters of monetary policy are matters for the board of the, the Reserve Bank. OK. In terms of stimulus, we've had the $3.8 billion. Um, the, there's been plenty of people calling for you to bring forward the next tranche of tax cuts, which you're resisting, but you've left the door open. When will you decide? What's going to make up your mind on whether you do bring that forward or not? Well, I must say, I had a bit of a, a chuckle to see the Labor Party ask us to bring forward tax cuts that they oppose. We will always be the, uh, the party of lower taxes. And as I said, we've implemented significant tax cuts, not just for income earners, but also for small businesses. Uh, we'll con continue to consider our policies, both at my EFO and in terms of the budget. Uh, but what we have focused on is implementing the the tax cuts as legislated, which... Yeah, but they haven't see, had the hope, the effect you were hoping they, for. But they're going to continue to play, play out, Fran. But I'll tell you what so I So what sort do. of numbers will you be looking for that might to suggest to you and Matthias Cormann you better bring these forward? Well, as you know, early December we'll see the result of the September, September national accounts. Um, <laughs> but I want to point out that we are growing faster according to the OECD in 2020, than the United States, than Canada, than Japan, than European countries. And what we will not do, what Scott Morrison and myself will not do, is impose $387 billion of higher taxes, which is the Labor Party's policies to The Labor this Party's day. gone. That's gone. That's, that was the last election. They're gone. That, that's and, not coming in anywhere. Why are you still talking about it? Well, because they are the alternative government in this yeah, country. But that's not even their policies anymore. Well, is it? Uh, that's news to me. I well, mean, they've had, they've had an election loss, they've had a review, they've had a couple of headland speeches, and the only thing that survived is their $387 billion of higher taxes. So, you know, Bill, uh, you've got Anthony Albanese, Jim Chalmers talking about tax cuts when they've got on their books $387 yeah, billion why of higher taxes. Talking about Labor? Because Labor has the alternative approaches that they're putting to the Australian people. They're always relevant to this debate, but what we will not do is go down that path, nor we will go down the path of reckless spending, which would be a sugar hit for the economy, uh, pretending to be a sugar hit for the economy. What we will focus on is considered stable government and ensuring that the Australian economy continues to grow. OK. You gave a speech about uh, growth and levers for growth this week mm -hmm. to CEDA. You talked about population, participation mm -hmm. and productivity as the drivers for growth. Mm -hmm. You talked about the um, challenges of the ageing demographic. Um, that's in the context of we got your plan this week for the um, entire retirement income review. Uh, that, that discussion paper was released on Friday. Is the government still committed to lifting the superannuation guarantee to 12% by 2025. Is that still a guarantee? Well, that's legislated and we said we haven't uh, any plans to change it. We've been very clear, both the Prime Minister and I, on that. Uh, the key point... So you're committed to that? You well, think that's a, the well, best we've plan? Said we're not, we've said we're not changing that. It's already legislated. Now, the key, the key point here, though, uh, is that we do have an ageing of the population. It's a wonderful thing that people are living longer. But we also need to plan for it. And it's a demographic shift that we need to plan for it. And it's not about asking people, uh, forcing people to work longer. What we're saying here is people should have an opportunity and the choice if they so choose to engage in further skilling and, and other activities. It's, it's all very well, but there's 175,000 people over the age of 55 on Newstart. They don't have the choice. They're looking for jobs. They're not there. And the, and the programs that we have put in place, like Restart, which involve... They're tiny, uh, though. Well, no, it offers up to $10,000 to an employer to take somebody on who's actually been on income support. So and it's how many people have they goes. taken on? Well, they're, they're taking on people, as well as we've got other skilling programs, as well as the pension work bonus, where you can earn up to three hundred dollars a fortnight without affecting your pension. So the key point here is we're looking for opportunity and choice. Whether it was Wayne Swan, Peter Costello, former treasurers have all raised this issue about the workforce participation implications of an ageing population. It's a challenge, no doubt about it. Just finally, Treasurer, do you back the calls from some of your colleagues for a former Chinese spy to be granted asylum in Australia? 
Well, I saw the comments from Andrew Hasty. He's a respected colleague and he's entitled to his view, but this is obviously uh, now in the hands of our law enforcement intelligence agencies. I won't comment on the specifics of an ASIO operational matter, but what I will say is that the government makes no apologies for the laws that we've introduced around foreign interference and foreign influence, the fact that we're now providing record resourcing to our agencies. Josh Frydenberg, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be with you.